This podcast is sponsored by the Music Player Network at musicplayer.com, the premier musician resource for keyboard players and beyond. Since the year 2000, the Music Player Network has been the go-to source for news and views on music technology, playing tips, and gigging help. The Keyboard Corner is one of the longest-running keyboard forums in Internet history, with guitar, bass, drum, and numerous recording and music tech forums also on offer. Frequented by weekend warriors, manufacturers' representatives, and professionals alike, MPN provides an invaluable resource for any musician, and it's 100% free to sign up and use. Go to www.musicplayer.com to see for yourself. Welcome to episode 30 of the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. And I'm joined again by my brilliant co-host, Paul Bindig. How are you, Paul? Oh, I'm great. Thanks, Dave. Now, can you believe we've hit 30 episodes? It blows my mind a little bit, I've got to say. It's, it's gone so quickly, and it's been an absolute blast doing it, too. It has, and it continues to be a blast. And, and I won't say it's by planning, it's, it's partly by fluke, but I can't think of a better person to celebrate the 30th episode of the show with than interviewing the brilliant Steve Picaro, who arguably has one of the best performance and recording CVs in the world. I mean, prolific is an understatement, Paul, isn't it, with Steve? Absolutely. That the challenge for us really is what not to ask him because you could talk to this bloke for hours and hours on end. That's right. And as you'll hear, um, Steve gives some brilliant insights into a whole range of areas, and it was an absolute pleasure to talk to him. Um, the amount of times I thought, "Oh, I want to explore that more," but made myself move on. Um, I'll let you judge where those points may have been, but um, yeah, hope you enjoy the interview. Steve, thanks so much for joining us on this historic day, about 24 hours until a, a big event in the US, I believe. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yes. Thank you for uh, welcoming yeah, me. And I, it's great to talk. I didn't check your politics before, but I assume just everyone will be pleased to have a little bit more um, stability um, in 24 hours. So, yes, thinking of you guys over yeah. there. Yeah, we're lo really looking forward to it, um, you know. So, Steve, we've been asking guests for well over a year now how they're keeping busy in these very challenging times. I can't imagine that's an issue for you. But, yeah, what have you been doing in these, this COVID era to, era to keep um, busy? Uh, you know, it's really not any different than uh, exactly what I wanted to be doing at this point anyway. I'd been on the road for the last 10 years before this, and I was – really done with it. I just couldn't wait to get home and just be in my studio. Um, and, uh, you know, it turned out I had no choice. So it was kind of fine with me. I mean, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it, but, uh, I've just been in my, luckily I have a, a great home studio and, um, I've been able to spend a whole lot of time in it, which is what I've been doing. And, and just, uh, just doing all kinds of so much has been neglected in the last 10 years while I've been touring. And it's just been great to get all my backup stuff, all kinds of technical stuff that's been on my to-do list for really some of it over 10 years, uh, some of it even more than that. And I've just been kind of uh, checking things off the list and I wanted to uh, hit this new year on the ground running, you know, and, uh, and I've been able to. It's been great. That's great. Actually. And we will probably talk to you about some of those things you've checked off on your list in a little while as well. But we, um, I wanted to start, and we usually ask uh, people to give a potted history of their upbringing and how they got into music. But I'm aware of a great story of yours that, that summarises that beautifully. Are you happy to sort of retell the story of your 13-year-old self going to your first show at the Hollywood Bowl? Uh, say that again. What about the Hollywood? Your Bowl? first show that you went to, um, that you were taken along to, and what oh, what inspired? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yes. I mean, I had seen a couple other concerts uh, before. And, of course, my dad being a musician and uh, he would sometimes be in a house band. So I, I had seen some other artists growing up. But my first real rock concert was going with my brothers and some other friends to see Emerson, Lincoln Palmer at the Hollywood Bowl. And it just was uh, it was truly life life changing, you know. We we went there. We were all big fans of Edgar Winter of Edgar mm. Winter's White Trash. That was the the opening band, and that's what we were there to see. Um, and uh, and Edgar was amazing. Um, and then Humble Pie was playing, and I kind of didn't know who they were. Uh, I really didn't know who Humble Pie was at that age, and um, but they got an incredible response. I mean, they had a huge standing ovation. Uh, at the end of their set and the the audience wasn't uh, uh they didn't want them to go and i and i remember thinking god how are what's this next band how are they going to follow that you know i just and i really didn't know who emerson lincoln palmer was i'm pretty sure i was aware of the single lucky man but i was like how is that band going to follow this um but boy they came out and from the very first song it just was uh Jaw dropping, not only for me, but I think everybody in the Hollywood Bowl that night. It was just uh, the energy and the music, and uh, you know, it just was amazing. And because I, I believe was it Tarkas that particularly blew your mind at that show? Sure. Well, absolutely. Everything yeah. they did, they came out and did their Barbarian, and uh, uh, was the first song they played, and I just was like, "What the hell is this?" You know. Um, yeah, before they even came on, uh, uh, a road usually right. People, a lot of guys these days, they 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 want to keep their sounds under wrap. They don't want to give away anything before the band comes on stage. But this guy tested the Moog synthesizer and just you know started all of a sudden this huge rumbling came out of the speakers. Uh, this is before they were on the stage. This yeah. is, the lights were still on, and it actually wasn't even completely dark. Oh, you know, it was dark by then. By in Humble Pie said it was dark. Uh, um, anyway, this huge rumbling was coming out of the speakers, and uh, it sounded amazing. And it just did this slow glide up to a really high note. And I just, uh, uh, I just remember saying out loud, "What the fuck is that?" You know what I mean? It, it really blew my mind and uh they came out and just uh i it's hard to explain what it what it did i just was kind of uh it just really turned my head around as far as what was possible and just keith was uh um he really kind of besides the music and all that you know he really was as far as performance and all that went really was a, a keyboard player's Jimi hendrix you know as far as performance went and just uh was an, it was an amazing first rock concert, yeah, to put it mild. To say the least, yes. And um, I, I never believe everything I read on the um, internet, Steve, but is it true your first ever keyboard was um, made by Ream? Because I'd love to find out more about that. Yes, and Ream, I, I still see their name around, usually on like air conditioning yeah. systems or hot water heaters or something like that. But um it, it, they still use the same logo today, I think, as then. And uh, I don't know. I was really young and wasn't expecting anything like that. Uh, it was a Christmas. It was uh, officially the best Christmas ever. Um, <laughs> we had uh, we had opened all our everyone had opened all their presents, but there was still these two big things and behind the tree and. One was a Ream organ, the other one was a Harmony amplifier for it. And uh, um, I don't know where my dad got them, but, um, and of course, you know, I, the portable organs then were either a Farfisa yeah. or a Fox Continental or something like that. But um, anyway, I, I just was completely blown away. And uh, yeah, best Christmas ever, for sure. Absolutely. They you mentioned when you saw Emerson Lake and Palmer for the first time, how, how that sound of that Moog coming through the, the speakers, you know, blew your mind as I'm sure it did everyone there. Apart from that, what, what was it that made you fall in love with synthesizers and, and synthesis? How did you get drawn towards that world? 
Well, there was a few things. I mean, first of all, I, re I remember as a kid um, living in Connecticut, and when I was only probably six or seven years old, my my parents took me to some convention. Uh, uh, some, you know, it was like a NAM show, but what it was they were selling, I wasn't sure. It was some kind of expo, or I'm, I don't know the right word. Um, anyway, it was like a convention, and there were all these booths different booths around and in one of the booths there was this very young kid he had to be a uh just in his early teens or something and he was playing like a theater organ you know he was uh it wasn't oh. huge but it was huge to me he was playing an organ and he just was playing a standard i remember it was the song more um and uh uh it it just blew my mind and all this you know i just was kind of all the the switches and dials and, you know, and stops and uh, the buttons and lights just kind of <laughs> really attracted me. I had, you know, I was always taking piano lessons um, and uh, it was kind of dreary, the lessons I was taking and trying to learn to read. And uh, um, but this just kind of opened my eyes and I thought, boy, that looked like a lot of fun. And then, uh, um, you know, then much later on when we lived in California and my, my brother, Jeff, uh, uh, you know, right out of, right out of high school before he had finished high school, he was on the road playing. And then my brother, Mike, just when he got out of high school, he was on the road playing bass. And, and then both of them were doing sessions and they were doing session sessions with really good people. I mean, before I was out of high school, Jeff was playing with Steely Dan and, uh, um, you know, they were doing these amazing gigs and uh, I was getting ready to graduate. And I, you know, I was thinking about it, like me kind of coming up and I just wanted to do what they were doing. They were kind of showing me that it was possible, you know, yeah. um, but I hadn't as much as I had some uh, a lot of amazing teachers growing up. I was never a good student. I, I was never. Um, I really couldn't improvise well. I uh, uh, I looked around and saw like what my competition was going to be, and it was all these guys that were heroes of mine, actually, you know. And um, yeah. and I was nowhere near in their league, you know, playing wise. Um, but I had started getting very interested in synthesizers. I had some friends in high school that were a lot better off than I were that had you know Moogs and Arps and and uh, one friend in particular, and uh, you know, I kind of saw at the time, you know, this is this is the mid '70s, uh, that there really was this kind of chasm at the time. Yeah, there were exceptions. There were people like uh, uh, Chick Corea, say, or Herbie Hancock, that seemed to be good at synthesizers and playing, or especially someone like Keith Emerson. But um, in the studio world here in LA, the best players they really didn't know. You know what I mean? They really, maybe they could, they could play synthesizers, sure, but they didn't know how to program them or they really weren't interested yep. programming them. And the guys that were the best with synthesizers, they were kind of nerds, you know what I mean? Who didn't, you know, who weren't good players, you know? So I kind of saw this space there, this opportunity to uh, jump in and really, you know, be that guy that knew how to, make a mini Moog trigger an ARP, which was a big deal back mm. in those days, you know, MIDI and all that. And um, I became that guy so that, you know, all these keyboard players that I was worried about competing with, they wound up hiring me on all their, you know, whenever they would do synthesizers, they'd hire me. Guys like David Foster and, of course, David Page and uh, a few others. And so I got to be on all these amazing sessions uh, certainly not because of the way I played piano, but uh, um, the way I, how I knew synths and could connect, you know what I mean? And if I had to play a part, it, you know what I mean? I I, uh, I could play a funky bass part if I had to, you know? Yeah, yeah. So the versatility and, and you know, facility in, in both worlds. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. I mean, nowadays, you know, most, you know, nowadays, most great, great uh, uh keyboard players you know most guys out there really have a handle on sense they don't they don't so much need a guy like me unless they you know want to really go off the deep end but uh back then it was very different yeah and, and the newer thing and it, it, it 
talking of your session work, that's certainly something we'd love to explore in, in a bit more detail because you've, you've played with so many amazing artists. But the point you made about um, being right at the forefront of synthesis, we're really curious, and I think our listeners will be too, you, you've obviously experienced the peak of the analog synth age plus experienced everything digital synthesis has to offer as well. And, and I'm really interested in your view on analog synthesis versus digital synthesis. What do you love about either? Or what are the frustrations of working with either? Sure, sure. Do you have a specific question or do you want yeah, me to no, just... No, look, three uh, hours is fine, Steve. It's just, yeah, we know it's a big <laughs> question, so just cover what you feel comfortable with. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, um, you know, there was nothing like, you know, I mean, to this day, let's say, uh, um, I love dialing in a sound on a, uh, um, you know, on a, you know, on a modular synthesizer, there's nothing like it being able to take the time to really dial stuff. And I remember the, when I first, um, had a big system, had the big polyfusion modular, um, I remember our keyboard, you know, keyboard magazine here would, you know, guys who owned big modular systems would do columns and they'd, uh, uh, you know, kind of have the recipe to make a huge drum sound, you know, Roger Powell and even Bob Moog and guys would do columns and talk about putting sounds together. And if only you had that hardware, which, you know, I never had it and didn't think I would for a long time, but, um, you know, you'd spend all this time dialing up a, 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 a once I found myself having all this hardware I would spend hours and hours dialing up and tweaking and and uh, and you'd really wind up with something very cool and unique and it you know what I mean it really didn't sound like anyone else and uh, the problem being but your whole system was tied up with that sound you know the second you wanted to change it that all went away and uh, you know, and the way I was in those days, it would all go away very quick. Uh, you know, guys like Hans Zimmer now, I think they, you know, they have multiple modular systems. And once, you know, I, I uh, you know what I mean? I think he's got like a huge Moog system that pretty much is, you know, he, he keeps a bunch of cool drum sounds on there. You know, I'm not positive of this, but I think he's able to do that. And um, so, you know, my whole purpose was always to... Uh, have this stuff assist me in writing songs and making music. And, uh, um, you know, the reason I got into sequencers was, you know, I was studying orchestration and arranging, and I just wanted to to use that stuff so I could try out arrangements. I wasn't so much trying to sound like strings as I was just trying to, uh, um, I just wanted to hear my notes, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, um, so that was kind of more important to me. Um, and so nowadays, I mean, I know I, I, a lot of, uh, I disappoint a lot of hardcore analog guys when I talk about how much now I use plugins. And that's just because I've been through all that thing. I used to get up sequences and I had to go find the, you know, find the sound and all the different synthesizers I was using, or in the case of a mini Moog reprogram that bass sound I got up and hope I could get close to it, um, you know, and now it just comes up. All these sounds just come up just like I left them. And uh, that to me is more important. That outweighs, you know, uh, um, having it be the real thing all the time. You know what I mean? Yes, it sounds, you know, even, even at the risk of it sounding different and not as good, the composer in me is more important uh, serving that, you know what I mean, than being the synth guy, mm. you know? Yeah, understood. Yeah. Would you be willing to share some of your favorite plugins that you use? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, I love all the Spectrosonic stuff. Uh, um, a really cool thing I just got into, hang on a second, I'm going to look because I, I uh, you know, um, Zebra, there's a friend of oh, mine, yeah. uh, uh, John Lemkul. Are you guys hip to uh, Unify? You know, uh, John Lemkul has this new synth out called Unify that can actually bring any plugin into it, uh, uh, into itself. And uh, it's got amazing filters and amazing stuff. And all the stuff I learned doing analog synths has really come in handy with, um, with all these plugins and stuff. 
you know, I I have all the Arturia stuff mm. I love. It's not real happy inside of a sequencer, but um, um, I love all this stuff. I love what it does. I love the extras they put in there. Um, I love the fact that I can tweak my to my heart's content and then hit save, yes. and it comes back. You know, yeah. um, I mean, look, I'll always when I have my my all my Polyfusion stuff right now is being um, refurbished and fixed up. Good as new. Polyfusion has been very good to me. And uh, I can't wait to have a bunch of that back. Every now and then, there's nothing like having those old big knobs and uh, um, being able to patch something up and get to the point and dial it in. I love doing that all the time. I love doing that uh, uh, from time to time. But um, yeah. overall, um, I'm more concerned, especially at my age now, about output. I just want to I want to get my songs finished and I want to put them out there and let people... Uh, hear what it is that i'm uh, that i'm hearing yeah. you know no great point and, and steve i mean obviously you alluded to the fact that you you started out doing a lot of a massive amount of sessions with a lot of great artists so i'm interested in the broadest level on how you think things have changed as far as working with artists over the decades so i mean to take uh, an extreme comparison say you know M michael jackson versus christine aguilera but even in those earlier eras just all those different artists how you had to come in and approach working with them and what you believe's changed if anything yeah well you know i don't i certainly don't do as much of that as i used to and and uh you know one thing that's changed for everybody and i don't know maybe some guys aren't uh um some guys have never known it, you know what I mean? As far as what it's like to be in the room mm. with the artist, with the engineer, with the producer and having to deliver something right then, you know, um, believe me, sometimes it was very frustrated. I wish I could. It was kind of insane the way we used to, you know, in the old days, you'd be programming the sound while they're trying to come up with the part, you know, what you're actually going to play on the sound while at the same time they're recording the sound, at the same time they're, uh, uh, you know, you were doing everything at once. Uh, you know, you'd slow down your attack and the engineer would say, hey, what happened to the level? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, it was really frustrating in a lot of ways, but it kind of, uh, um, it made you get good at being fast, you know, at being fast and delivering quick, you know? Uh, uh, but it was also very frustrating in these days. I, I love, you know, uh, you know, right around Toto 4 is when I finally, they made me some slaves where I could go and, you know, what I told the guys I was doing was, hey, I'm just going to try out my parts. Don't worry, I'll, I'll do it in the studio with all of you guys around and the engineers sitting there and all that. But I just want to test out some things hmm. first. Well, you know, they wound up using every single thing I recorded. You know what I mean? Because sometimes <laughs> maybe it was some modular patch that I was never going to get up again. And luckily I had it on tape, you know, uh, the year before on our third Toto album, I had kind of done the same thing. I would, I wanted to kind of be able to experiment without the guys breathing down mm -hmm. my neck. So I would transfer a couple of the, I would transfer the rhythm tracks to two tracks of an eight track Otari, yep. you know, tape machine. And I would use the remaining six tracks to experiment. And I did some of the most amazing stuff I'd ever done in my life. You know, just some happy accidents and some uh, uh, the way I would record all the effects, something that in, you know, they do that in England a lot, but not so much in L.A. You know, they always say, oh, we'll do that on the mix. They want everything dry. Well, I just was going for it. And um, I got some magical stuff that. The only reason no one's ever heard it is because I wasn't in sync. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe some of that stuff could have been flown in, but uh, I had to, you know, redo it all in the studio with the engineer and all the guys there. And, uh, a whole, you know, probably 80% of it, you know, was never, I never was able to recreate it. And no one was ever able to hear it, you know. So just the next year, the only difference was I was on a 24 track that had sync code on it. And they were able to use my my experiments just in case they worked, which most of them did. 
Absolutely. And just on the Cinco, you raise a fascinating point, particularly for our younger listeners, just how critical that was. And I, I can't quite remember the specifics, Steve, but I know when um, you and the guys are working on the Thriller album, you had a big issue with Sync Code and um, Eddie Van Halen's guitar slash, I assume on Beat It or whatever, and there had to be lots of rework done. Does that ring any bells to you? I can't quite remember the specifics. Sure, of yeah. course. Yeah, no, I think Ed, Ed had cut, they'd cut the tape for some reason. I don't remember what the reason they cut the tape was, but that, you know, screwed it up from being in sync. Now, remember, we're just talking about tape machines mm. being in sync, okay? The recorders being in sync. The actual, on most of those things, except Beat It, Beat It was recorded to a drum machine, but uh, most stuff, I mean, certainly on all the Toto stuff, with a couple exceptions, you got to remember, I was trying to sync up to live drums. Yeah. My brother hated playing to a click. Uh, he really hated it. And um, meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out how to work all these sequencers and all this stuff. And I was in a band with a drummer who didn't want to know about playing to a click track. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to do uh, uh, try to do so, as best I could after the fact. And it was it was very difficult, you know. Yeah. And we where we do we all take it for granted now that we start off with. You know what I mean? Everyone playing to some, you know, to a steady tempo. That's taken for granted now. And uh, no one minds playing to a, a steady tempo. But back in the day, you know, when Toto was still making, uh, when Toto was making those records, um, we never played to a click. My brother was very proud of his time and the way it felt. And uh, um, yeah, click was kind of a no-no thing unless we were trying to do something mechanical. That's right. And, and what, what was amazing about that too, and, um, and I don't want to take too much of a sideline out of, of keyboards, but I mean, Jeff was also though yeah. instrumental as far as championing things like using the Lin drum for innovative additions to drums. So he, he, was, he was great, obviously, as a drummer, but also did have the open mind for other stuff when it was required. Well, no? not as much as I would like, to be honest yeah, okay. with you, but... <laughs> But my my attitude about all that stuff when drum machines came out, I mean, a lot of drummers really were threatened. Yeah, yeah. Some people really did start using them and started off, you know, started using them on records. Um, but uh, my attitude was always, who who knows better how to program a drum machine than a drummer? Yeah, you know, that's right. Who knows better what a drummer would like to do with a third hand? You know, a third arm? You know. No, agreed. And and so I mean, with the studio stuff. It's impossible to work through your actual discography. We could take 14 episodes to do that. So I just thought I'd pick out a couple <laughs> of things um, and outside of uh, the totally obvious one. So, um, Steve, one of the, I, I'm, if I've been in a debate with people that grew up in the 80s, I always argue there are two, the two greatest songs of the 1980s to me are Small Town Boy by Bronsky Beat and Boys of Summer by Don Henley. Now, you obviously mm -hmm. worked on one of those. Can you tell us about yep. your experience working um, on uh, building the perfect beast? Yes, I had uh, I'd worked on, by the way, that was because of my brother, Jeff. Yep. You'll love this. I got a call at one o'clock in the morning. This was, uh, I'm starting with Don's previous album. Um, I think it was called I Can't Stand Still. Oh, yep. And uh, I, I never, I didn't know who Don Henley was. I wasn't that savvy about the names of guys in bands. But I got a call from my brother at one o'clock in the morning one night. And uh, he knew I'd be up working. And um, he told me he was at the studio, which was actually down the street, which was just 10 minutes away from me. And he was there with Don Henley. And they'd been working on a track all day. And uh, we're just trying to get, uh, it wasn't so much a synthesizer thing, but they they had this Farfisa organ and they were trying to get this track and having trouble with it. And that had been cut to a drum machine. Um, and so because of that, you know, I just went down there and I brought a small piece of modular gear and it wound up being the song Dirty Laundry. And uh, they really wanted this Farfisa, but they wanted it to be perfectly in time. And so I just kind of wound up doing a gating thing with it. You know, they had had the drum machine. I was able to, luckily, the engineer had recorded the sync tone, which is different than the sympty tone. The sync tone was specifically for the drum machine. And for a long time, people didn't know they had to record that if they ever wanted to sync it back up. Well, Don had done that. You know, his engineer, Greg Ladani, had done that. 
I was able to sync it back up and I was able to just program a very simple pattern that that drove the gate, that triggered the gate to open up. And it was a Farfisa, not a synthesizer going through it. And um, and they loved it and they thought I was brilliant. Well, really, it could have been done with a, a gate yeah. that they had there. You know what I mean? I could have done the same thing with a, a gate, what I did for the most part. Anyway, I started working a lot for Don and... Um, they were they were actually they had already cut the song Boys of Summer okay. was done. It was cut and recorded and they wanted it up a half step. Don decided being the great producer that he is, uh, he knew that high note that he sang in the chorus and he wanted it to be one half step higher. He wanted the key of the whole song changed. And uh, they thought maybe I had some magic box, you know what I mean, that did it, <laughs> you know, that would transpose the entire track and uh you know i mean there wasn't even there wasn't any you know serato right. pitch in time there was nothing then really uh there was a pool you know publison or some other stuff you know or, or you know harmonizer type of things that you know sounded horrible um anyway i i wound up going down to the studio and along with mike uh campbell mm -hmm. um the co-writer of the song uh, we just, I just redid the song, you know, the, of course the drums didn't need to be changed, but, um, we just re-recorded the song in the new key, you know? Wow. And, uh, anyway, that was it. I just did the basic synth parts with him that go throughout the song. And, uh, you know, they wound up bringing in Pino Palladino on bass. <laughs> uh, uh, Danny Korchmar did all these other amazing guitar parts and, Anyway, they had the song in the key. I just kind of just went and redid it with the uh, with the guitar player who wrote it. Well, thank God. Um, yeah, it, for no Serato pitch in time. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's the story of that one. You know, you mentioned before about the you know the pressure of uh, particularly years ago of, of going to the studio and and putting things together uh, on demand. Whew. From an outsider's perspective, it, it seems like maybe the USA for Africa project would, would have definitely been one of the high-pressure examples. I'm really interested in your experience working on that record. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, that was the kind of, especially something like that, where there was kind of this almost circus atmosphere with all the people that were around and there was always yeah. someone filming you. And, you know, the day I was there, uh, Ray Charles was there to put his overdubs on. You know what I mean? It was mm. just... It was crazy, you know. It just was crazy. Um, that's why in those kind of things you you've got to be able to deliver, you know. And you know, speaking of this, speak, speaking of this, um, you know, this was a great source of frustration with my band. You know, um, the guys in Toto they knew of me doing this. They knew that with uh, Quincy Jones, I would do three songs in one afternoon. You know, uh, you know, I was that guy. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, uh, you know, I could, you know, we could get that done. And they used to beg me to just do that with Toto. <laughs> you know, why can't you just do what you do with Quincy with us? You know, and, um, you know, I just was always, a, you know, I wasn't the same kind of musician as those guys. Those guys were all such amazing natural talents. And, um, you know, I was always frustrated at those Quincy Jones sessions because I wanted to take more time. Okay. I wanted to, you know what I mean? I wanted to uh, double things, do five string parts and bounce it down to one. And you know what I'm saying? And, and yes. build up my string parts that way. But of course you couldn't, they would say, look, we got three tracks left and we've got three synth parts to do, you know, go, you know what I mean? Um, so there was always a, a, a source of frustration where with Toto, I, you know what I mean? Because I was a band member, I could say, you know what, I want to mm. take the time to do it this way, you know, do it a certain way, um, which always took a lot more time, you know, um, since weren't easy in those days, you know, <laughs> especially to do something complex and to keep them in tune and, uh, you know, to try to realize some of my ideas, you know? Yeah, and you, and you want to take that opportunity to to experiment and create yeah. when, when it's afforded to you. Sure, but they it would drive them nuts, you know, because they would <laughs> go to a session and you know what I mean. Like I said, literally do three songs in a three hour session, and why are you taking a week on this? You know. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, of course, yeah. It's uh, you're trying to be creative. 
Yeah. I was wondering, given your extensive history, whether you wouldn't mind pulling out a couple of, for you, what were real highlights uh, in the studio, things that uh, things that were you know, that you're particularly proud of or you're particularly enjoyed over that time. Sure. Well, of course, things like uh, uh, you know, I thought I'd you know show the guys you know things like the Rosanna solo, the synth solo mm-hmm. in Rosanna. Yes. You know, that's not going to be done in a three-hour session. No. You know, um, that was you know that you know I took over a week to do that. Um, there were some happy mistakes because I was engineering myself. Uh, things like David Page had done a solo. He had tried a solo. Uh, when I wasn't around one time, I did some Hammond organ stuff and did some backwards Hammond stuff. And uh, anyway, I decided that I wasn't, I didn't want to use any of it. And so I erased it all. <laughs> I had thought, you know, the day before they mixed it, as I was putting the solo together, it just needed one, it needed like an outro uh, of the solo I had done. And Lo and behold, I, I'm thinking, trying to think of what I'm going to put there at the very outro, and I see the meter of a track moving. Well, it turns out I hadn't erased David's part all the way, and oh. uh, all that was left was this really weird descending Hammond smear with echo slap on it and stuff, and uh, you know what I mean? Because I was engineering myself and didn't do that great a job of erasing him uh it was there you know happy accidents <laughs> like that you know yeah yeah you know can, can i ask a follow-up on that that solo when you did it was it a case of you you went away and spent your time working on it and, and brought it back and played it for the guys and they went oh my god that's amazing which is what i thought when i first heard it or, or was it more of a work in progress where you know they were hearing bits of it and you were as you were developing it nope they never heard it really until the mix until the yeah, day cool. we mixed it and what was also great was that uh um you know with bands and with engineers and produce you know with all the people around there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of politics. I mean, we got along great as a band for the most part, but in the studio, like I said, I was kind of the real uh, wild card. Um, yep. You know, and uh, um, but what was fantastic about that album was that the guy who mixed it, Greg Ladani, he had nothing to do with the rest of the album. You know, he had nothing to do with the tracking. That was other guys. That was Al Schmidt and Tom Knox and other guys. He had nothing to do with any of the overdubs. He had nothing. So he didn't have, um, you know, guys in the band whispering into his ear and telling him how he liked Mm -hmm. stuff. He just, you know, got the tracks up. He didn't know who recorded what, you know. He just uh, uh, looked at everything with fresh ears and eyes and um, loved the solo and cranked it. You know what I mean? Uh, Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was great. And I and I had learned just the year before I, uh, you know, the guys were all telling me, well, you can go ahead and screw around with the with a tape. But, you know, we can't use any of your stuff. You're not an engineer. And I and I wasn't an engineer. But what they didn't know was that the guy who had produced our who engineered and co-produced our previous album. um, I had uh, his name was Jeff Workman. He uh, he taught me. I asked him. I said, why, if I recorded myself, why couldn't it be used? Mm. And he just gave me this amazing lesson in gain structure. You know, I would ask him, I mean, I would use this stuff all the time in the studios and stuff, but I said, how do I know if I'm sending my stuff to a harmonizer or to a tape, you know, to a tape slap, you know, to a, a, an echo device? How do I know I'm giving it the optimum level, you know? How do I, you know, how do I know? I would just kind of guess and it would come out okay. But like, why couldn't my stuff be used? I really didn't know anything about game structure. And he very patiently, luckily I was working on this small um, Trident console, um, but it had meters on everything. And he just showed me the whole basics of zero VU and, uh, uh you know, if the board was set up right, if it was tuned right, just, you know, with zero VUs that I could just, how I could go around and know that I was getting the best levels. And, uh, you know, and so, and that's all I did. I didn't care about compression. I didn't want to know about EQ. I just wanted to get my stuff on tape so it could be used. And he taught me all that. So 
all of my tracks and I could bounce things down. I could take up a whole slave tape of, of, uh, and fill it up with synthesizers and bounce it all down to two tracks with, you know, which was the case on the Rosanna solo. And, um, there was nothing wrong with it. The levels were bang on and, you know, the guy who mixed it loved it. And it's, I mean, that's another example of, you know, putting on the white coat, so to speak, and, and getting behind yep. and, and checking out how it works. Um, Yep. Now, Steve, this is really the, important, then, you know. Yeah, it is absolutely important. Now, this may be another apocryphal story on the internet, but I believe at one stage you and David Pace did have to wear a white coat to preview a new synth you'd been given a look at. Is that is that true? Oh, maybe. Uh, you know, we would go to, uh, you know, after all that, we went to Japan a couple times. We went to Hamat Matsu, the Yamaha yeah. factory. You know, they were showing us uh, they were showing us some new technology and stuff, and they would. They would give us lab coats, I think, once or twice. Um, but yeah, that that was just <laughs> yeah. kind of you know them uh, letting us feel uh, a part of the yeah. team there. And, and was that as a synth nerd? Was that as much a um, a pinch yourself moment as some of perhaps your live and studio stuff and working with great artists for you? It's like I never thought I'd get to this sort of level of touring synth factories. Oh, absolutely. But it was, you know what I mean? That was a funny time because that's when kind of all of a sudden the line was drawn. You know, my my whole thing was balancing out my piano playing and my synthesizer stuff. You know, that was my how I kind of made myself different from other people was where I drew that line. You know what I mean? I would still spend time practicing Chopin etudes. Uh, you know, to keep my my chops up so that I could play stuff I wanted to play. Um, but you know what I mean? And I was very I loved it was a pinch yourself moment when Yamaha's inviting you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but because I had, you know, the way I had gotten in with them was with the was with the synthesizer, the CS80. Yeah. And uh, uh, I really got in with them through that and how well I knew that synthesizer. And uh, but then, you know, that was right at the time when it started getting into digital that way and programming DX sevens. You know, we had used the uh, uh, GS one, oh, yeah. which was their first kind of four operator FM synth to great effect on Africa. Mm. That was all those limba sounds. And we actually, you know, actually knew guys that were programming for them and they did some custom sounds for us because they weren't programmable, no. you know. Uh, uh, you just kind of used what they had, but we, you know, uh, I would get so in with them. They, they introduced us to some of the guys that were, you know, making those sounds and they would do custom stuff for us, which was the case on Africa. We were really able to dial that stuff in, but once it got to the right after that was the DX seven and to all of a sudden master that and really, you know, I got to a pretty good point on it, but it kind of became, okay, how much time do I want to mm. spend programming a synth sound? You know, it certainly wasn't something you could do on a session, you know. Uh, you know, some of us, you could get good at maybe editing a little bit, changing the release, changing the attack. But even that was just this whole different, uh, you know, whole different way of doing it that was a lot more time consuming. And... Um, Especially for me, as as much as I like to promote myself, because I wanted to have sounds and synthesizers before anyone else did and loved getting in with these companies, all of a sudden it was like, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, give me these synths early and I'll program sounds for you. <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, I get a DX7 and it's like, all of a sudden it wasn't as much fun anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> The D. It got way too intense for yeah. me, to be honest. And the DX7 is yeah. famous for that. It, it's, I think it turned a lot of people off programming. Yeah, yeah. You know, and as much as it did certain things, it's still, you know, I was still kind of that guy going, yeah, but where's the string sound? You know, get me a good string sound. You know, I still had to deal with that in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it did great mallet stuff. It did, you know, that percussive stuff was amazing and those real complex attacks like that, but uh, it still didn't do a great string sound, no, you know? That's right. <laughs> so while we're talking... You know, and come to find out, and, and believe me, and I studied, uh, uh, Robert Moog used to do, um, you know, string tone simulation columns in Keyboard yeah, Magazine. Yeah. I still have them. 
using mm-hmm. analog synths and using all these complex multiple resonance arrays to uh, uh, get good string sounds. You know, all I wanted was what, you know, samples wound up doing. That's all I was trying to do. Right. You know, <laughs> I didn't need to be the guy doing that. You know, many people hired me to do string parts on their records and stuff with analog synths. And, uh, you know, all I was, you know, and, and it was always very frustrating because, you know, if the filter was up bright, it sounded like a synthesizer to me. Mm. So I would always, when I'd listen to it alone, I'd always close the filter down. And then when you'd listen to it in the track, it sounded like flutes. You know what I mean? If you were lucky. Um, Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's another important thing you learn is to tweak in the track while the track is running and to kind of try and leave it alone when they stop the tape. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to try to make it sound more real. And and with a wide open filter, uh, it didn't sound real to me. You know, anyway, all I was trying to do was do what, what people take for granted now. There's all these great sample libraries, you know, starting, you know, I think the first ones were like Roland and stuff yeah. like that, you know, for their their line of samplers. I, I had a bunch of 760s at one oh, yeah. point. But uh, you know what I mean? They just started, that's all I was trying to do, was just get a, you know, an acceptable sound like that to do high string lines and, right. you know, pat, nice pads, you know, um, the stuff they asked me to do in sessions. Yeah, exactly. And so while we're on the gear, I thought we might go a little bit down that road. So obviously you're not touring at the moment, Steve. You don't have a a performance rig as such, but I'm just interested, you know, if you suddenly had to go out, God forbid, on on tour, you know, in in a month's (laughs) time, um, what, what, you know, what would be your go-to pieces of gear? You think, okay, I need these to be able to feel comfortable. Well, again, it's very disappointing to gear freaks, but the last 10 years that I was on the road with Toto, I mean, right away, I started using Mainstage. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with that absolutely. program. Yeah. You know, I when I was doing my film work before I started going on the road again, I kind of, you know, was bundled with logic and I kind of just tossed it aside like, oh, what is this? Oh, it's a live thing. And I, you know, hadn't done live for a long time and had no intention of. But um, I loved it. The second I knew I had to go on the road again, I used to have a laptop on my riser with me flopping away while I was jumping on the stage there. Um, um, you know, I was able to actually use the sounds I had used on records and stuff, you know, on the, I mean, on the latest total records, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Um, I thought it was great. I still think it's great. And uh, again, it's not real sexy. And, you know, analog synth guys are, are uh, you know, I still love that when I see somebody with a couple Nords or, or, uh, you know what I'm saying, whatever mm-hmm. access stuff or, you know, any kind of analog synth stuff, the the sequential circuit stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I love when guys just are using that stuff on stage. But for me, recreating those records, which I kind of always felt was my job live, yeah. you know, was to recreate the records and stuff. And, um, you know, I did it the old way. I did it with a ton of keyboards on stage with and without MIDI, you know, either, you know what I mean? Back in the early, mm-hmm. you know, or late seventies, early eighties, jumping around, trying to do that. And then even with MIDI and, uh, uh, to organize it all, to, to change sounds, to have the tape slap be just like I want it now. Now I, the last 10 years with Toto, I suffer with it being perfect every time (laughs) and the exact level I want it to be, you know, is it the same as having those since there? Uh, Sometimes not, but you know, my attitude now is kind of keep the change. You know what I mean? I can't stay up all night. Like I used to for a week trying to get ready for those tours. It used to kill me trying to get ready for those tours and, and doing that. And now I just, uh, with um with main stage i uh i'm able to do what i need to do as far as splitting the keyboard up you know i just would go out there i i kind of did the multi keyboard thing when i was young and and this last 10 year run with toto that i did i i i just had two keyboards you know one 88 note piano type action and then one synth kind of action you know 76 or whatever it was um and I just kind of made it like a puzzle. How do I pull off this song as much like the record as I can with these two keyboards? But I had all my plugins. Mm-hmm. You know, I had all these uh, uh, 
different plugins. And on the later stuff, a lot of the string sounds were from, you know, EXS. You know what I mean? Were from a lot of the Logic stuff. I found that, uh, you know, even though maybe I used a Mini Moog on the record, that my ES2, you know, even even with Mini Moog plugins from Arturia or other people, it, it took up so much CPU. Yeah. I would just use the. Uh, I could get a pretty damn close sound on the ES2 that the, you know, the laptop I was running on at the time was, uh, I mean, in later tours, I wound up having Mac minis and stuff yeah. like that, which, were, and I had a double system where if something freaked out, he could just switch to the, to a whole nother system. But yeah. I was, uh, you know, and if it was something where I used to like, you know, for the end of, uh, or the middle of the Rosanna solo, where I would do a whole big sequence, you know, something I used a sequencer on. And I used to bring a Roland micro composer, triggering my polyfusion, <laughs> triggering three voices of polyfusion, you know, uh, mini Moog voices live to recreate that sequence. You know what? I would wind up just uh, sampling right. that, those two bars and triggering it as a sample, you know, uh, again, not nearly as sexy as it used to be. And uh, it's really disappointing to the young synth freaks <laughs> out there. But um, I just wanted it to be nailed and, and do it every night and, uh, you know, sound balanced, you know. Yeah, yeah, of course. You've got an extensive history as a composer and obviously a lot of experience that goes with that. These days, do you have a a fairly set approach to how you approach uh, composition or is every project different for you? Whew. Um, yeah, no, the, as far as composition goes, um, by the way, before I answer that one more session that maybe you guys don't know about, that was cool. Yeah, please. That nothing please. With Toto and nothing to do with Michael Jackson is uh, uh, the obvious ones was a song I co-wrote called in the way. And it's not, it was on a brothers Johnson. Album. Oh, okay called winners and i got to use my huge modular uh system with my micro composer my roland micro composer it was very cool and we did it to a click so i was able to lock it up and it's got a really cool intro and then it comes back in the middle of the song that's one to check out that was uh, a real fun one because i was able to use that stuff so as a composer um you know what I found? Uh, this was the great lesson for me as far as um, s um, film stuff goes. Or, se you know, even session stuff. Like I said, I'm I'm not able to... I, I, I was able to sit there and get it done in the amount of time I had because you had to. Um, when you're just a songwriter, when you're, you're nothing but a songwriter in the world, um, uh, um, it's very difficult because even with Toto, I wasn't, uh, you know, Toto was very, always very flexible with their deadlines. Mm. And uh, there's even a Toto album where I don't have, I didn't have one song on it. I, if I didn't come up with songs that year because I was too busy with synths and uh, um, I was too busy trying to figure all that out, it was no big deal. Mm. No one cared. There were so many other writers in the band. You know, most Toto albums I have one song on, you know, um, which is really disappointing to me because that's, you know what I mean? I, I would have rather traded, uh, you know, having more songs on a Toto album and not have spent so much time trying yeah. to get a fucking stirring sound. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I should have just waited knowing that samples were going to come. <laughs> but uh, um, what I'm getting to is what film work taught me uh, um, is that, you know, when I first got into film work, I didn't know, you know, when I was first offered a TV show, I, I just remember saying to myself, I really want to try it, but I never had to have anything done by Thursday. You know what I mean? Every week or uh Whenever, you know what I mean? I never really, uh, um, I, what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is that I found out that I love the deadline, you know, I never don't deliver, you know, um, I found that not only could I have it done by Thursday, I loved having it done by Thursday. I loved right. having it deadline i loved having that pressure of a deadline it really with all the other distractions in life whether it be family or friends or whatever when i have a deadline and i think this is true for a lot of people uh, um 
when I have a deadline, it, it enables me to say no. You know, it enables me to say no to people. Um, you kind of grow up and realize that as much fun as it is to make music and as if you are so lucky as to be able to make music for a living, there's some times that you got to go out and work when you really don't even feel like it. Mm. You know, as much as you love synths, as much as you love music, there's some times where you really would rather, you know, you hear about a, a party going on or, you know what I mean? Or... Uh, your girlfriend wants you to go somewhere or, you know, you just want to be a human being. You want to show up for your kids, uh, um, you know, and I'm not able to say no unless I have a deadline, you know, and with film and with TV, you have deadlines. And um, so when you're just a freelance songwriter, you know, it's um, it's very difficult. A lot of time went by in my life when I didn't have deadlines. And, um, you know, it's so easy to start songs. You know what I mean? Especially, you know, nowadays with all this great technology and all the cool drum beats that are available. And it's so easy to start a song. The real hard part is finishing, you know, is, is finishing something, saying it's done not to be making any disclaimers or excuses when you play it for people, you know? It's done, it's mixed, it's mastered, it's finished. Um, and I love finishing stuff now. And, um, you know, it's why I took so long to do a solo album. You know what I mean? I had never taken money from a company and they said, okay, we've given you this budget. We want this delivered by October. I had never done that. I was kind of afraid of doing that and said, you know what, I'll get it done when I get it done. And you know what, I never had a solo album until my hair was gray, you know? <laughs> um, but I just, that was because the only way I got it done, again, I didn't take money from anybody, but I'd been touring with Toto and I was really frustrated not being able to uh, work on a solo album. So between two tours, I'd given myself a deadline. You know what I mean? I was gonna get this done. I'm going to get this finished. I've announced to everybody I would have it, you know, I would have it in a year. And uh, the way I was going to make that deadline was keeping it, you know, making as if. And uh, I mean, that, and that was four years ago. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I would have loved to have had four solo albums since then. But uh, um, I've been, you know, distracted, very busy with touring. The touring, they doubled it up once I stopped having a TV show at the same time as I was touring with Toto. They just filled up that time that I would have been working on my show and being home with more and more touring, which is why I kind of finally had to stop because mm. uh, this is what I love doing more than anything. I have a blast on the road. I loved taking a bow for all that stuff I had did in all those years ago, but uh, um, I love being in the studio. The stuff is really getting fun and cool and, these plugins are amazing, and um, you know I love being in my room. Mm. All those, all those years of touring <laughs> and the shows that you played to, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. I'm sure there's some some things you've learned and picked up along the way, and a lot, a lot of our listeners are also keyboard players who might get out and play live. And I was wondering, what are some key things you've learned that that you'd love to pass on to other players about live oh about about performing live in a, in a in a band as a keyboard player yeah yeah of uh, you know um jeez uh you know it was always difficult with toto uh uh you know what i mean choosing my spots you know choosing my spots where i you know what i mean where you're just kind of a uh um you know, and when you're in a band where there's guitar players and there's a lot of distorted crunch guitar whole notes being held, you know, sometimes it's hard to mm -hmm. to find where your stuff goes, where you're heard. Um, I don't know. I mean, that was always my problem on the records as well. You know, it's just mm -hmm. uh, um, trying to find your space uh, where you're not fighting fighting the other frequencies going on and uh, um, just in general, you know what I mean? And, um, and live, I never, you know, I never wanted to be the mad scientist running around from synth to synth. And uh, uh, you know what I mean? Um, 
my whole attitude live, I mean, what I tried to do was make it look easy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Was try to look cool and make it look, you know, make it look like this stuff's a cinch. You know, they yeah. didn't have to know that I was up all night trying to figure <laughs> out how to, how to make it so I could do that. You know what I mean? But, uh, um, yeah, it just was, that's, that was my always is I've tried to make that my personality live was that I was, you know, look like I'm having fun up there, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know how else to answer yeah, and, you about that. But I think you're underselling right yourself too, Steve, as far as the looking cool thing, because I was about to say it's a very small field of competitors, but you'd definitely be in the top five of people that move well on stage as a keyboard player. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, you know what I mean? To me, it's more about the playing. I just, uh, I've always had fun live. Yeah. You know, I, I, I dance around. When we're in... Uh, um, you know, when we're in the studio, uh, you know, when I did sessions, you know, I was dancing to the music always. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just what I do when it's cranked up. You know what I mean? I have fun with it. And, uh, um, you know, live, I've never been the guy playing the basic keyboard parts or the doing the solos or whatever. I was just kind of I've always been the synth guy mm -hmm. and uh, and I love being the synth guy. I love doing that stuff. And I love trying to make it look real easy, yeah. you know? No, you, you, you do that extremely well. Now, and to go from one extreme of making it look easy, do, do you have some, we always ask guests about their most memorable train wreck. Do you have a, a memorable time where whether technically or musically something just went awfully wrong for you? Too many times to mention. <laughs> too, too many times. <laughs> you know, sir, I mean, um, all these memories are rushing to me. I remember one time at a, nam show when i first put when we first put together the uh we used to call it the triumvirate but it was it was james newton howard david page and myself wow. yeah. uh you know for yamaha we would do these nam shows for yamaha or we would you know we would do five or six shows a yeah. day um and i remember the first time it was just us up there i was trying to make it all self-contained it was us up there and i had used an lm1 drum machine I, and i had spent three nights programming it you know the in song mode for each of our for all of our stuff and just trying to make it perfect and adding some fills and using it in a cool way and i roger lynn who is a very good friend i invited him to one of our first shows and uh and the drum machine just went haywire it went from one song to another song while we were up there and and Roger was just laughing his ass off, and it was just such a train wreck. <laughs> I'll never forget with Roger there, just smirking and smiling and giving me a thumbs up, you know, ironically, sarcastically, yes. you know. <laughs> but there's been many, there's been many times, especially in the old days, you know. Uh, I'm telling you, that's why I love main stage mm. is because there wasn't so much of that anymore. You know, I just had to worry about the computer crashing, that's right. which it did from time to time and uh you know i would just give the stretch out you know stretch hand signal to lucather while we were waiting for it to reboot <laughs> which is, i think it's fair you know? to say you guys are good at stretching so i don't think that would ever have been much of a, a, a stretch as silly as that sounds. right exactly <laughs> no yeah usually it was between songs but there were a couple uh, uh train wrecks with main stage but uh not so much once i got this double system where we were yeah. able to you know, it was literally two complete systems where I was able to switch between, you know, from one to the other. That's right. You know. And and back in the studio, Steve, if you had to list a favorite project you've worked on in the last 10 years, what would it be? Ooh, in the last 10 years. Good question. Um, you know, there's there really hasn't been too much in the last 10 years in the studio other than you know, I mean, the norm now is, mm. is, and this is for everybody, is to, uh, right. you know, I remember it really kind of started happening just, I mean, we were, we were spoiled because we had two tape machines. You know, we were able to, uh, guys like Quincy Jones, guys like Don Henley, they would make us slave tapes. Mm. You know, this is before it became the norm. I would tell them, let me experiment and then I'll come back to the yeah, studio. Yeah. You know, or sometimes they would come over and let us, uh, record there you know um but uh you know the norm now you know i got to a point where i was like bringing my whole studio at david page's house <laughs> everything that was in there i'd bring all those keyboards down to a studio you know 
because it had to be on their turf, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, literally, uh, sometimes it was, you know, for uh, I did an Elton John thing a hundred years ago at Sunset Sound, and I even brought my Trident Flexi Mix mixing board. Everything was brought down to the studio, everything that was in our studio, except for the tape machines, yeah, of yeah. course, you know. Uh, now the norm is just to do them, you know what I mean? Now they send me files, sure. and I love it, you know. I love it. They send me files, and uh, um, I'm able to sync up right away. I'm able to have a sandwich when I'm hungry, <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? So, but what, to answer your question, gee, I'm trying to remember uh, what have been my favorite things. Probably working on my daughter's stuff, yeah. Heather Picaro. Yeah. You know? Because they, they uh, uh, you know, most people these days, it, it's... Um, where back in the day, you know, people used to play me a lot of other stuff. They would even play me my own stuff. You know, the guys in Toto would play me something I did three albums ago and say, get this sound back up. Yeah. And it was, you know what I mean, off, you were chasing your tail. You know, Quincy, other producers would play me a Prince record or something. And <laughs> can you get this sound? And they'd be A and B ing it, you know, they'd be listening to what I was doing. And, uh, oh, wow. You know, if they could hear any difference at all in the echo or how it lived in the song, you know what I mean? Sometimes uh, uh, people make that mistake. They'll hear a Peter Gabriel album and they'll hear a really cool sound. And it's like he's made this great space around. That's it. right. There's nothing else playing. There's just a bass drone going while that they, well, they hear that cool synth sound. And then the guys in the band would wonder why it doesn't sound the same. Well, we have a, you know, distorted guitar and five other things going on at the same time you know <laughs> That's... it's not gonna sound the same you know you're hearing it practically by itself on the peter gabriel album. you know what i mean there's things like context and stuff that uh and and on, on was hard on that too steve did speaking of peter gabriel did you ever dive down the rabbit hole of sort of fair lights and synclavias and all that sort of stuff you know, I, I, I very, uh, for a little bit, I, I, um, a friend loaned me a Synclavier for a while. Uh, there was a while, there was this thing called, uh, um, it was called the wave, uh, supposedly Peter Gabriel had used it. It was this big synth called, uh, it was this huge sampling thing that someone was trying to do. They actually had an office, the company near me, it was like a wave station, but not the wave station you're mm, thinking about yeah, yeah. that Korg made or something like that. And they had let me borrow one for a couple months to try to see, but no, I didn't go down that rabbit hole. And, um, uh, you know, um, you know, they were very incredibly, uh, uh expensive yes. and, uh, David Page would have gotten us anything I asked him to get. David was very, very generous and would, uh, um, would get whatever I told him to get. But um, no, I didn't really no. go down that rabbit hole. I probably should have. I remember having a very early, uh, uh, um, you know, a guy from Australia being, I remember we were at Sunset Sound. I was actually with Roger Lynn, and he had a fair light, you know, in his motor home with him. <laughs> um, and he demonstrated it for us. And, uh, I mean, it looked very, very cool. Indeed. But it was kind of... Uh, cost prohibitive yes. for me at the time steve in the in the coming year what what have you got on the horizon that we uh, might be able to look forward to hearing from you oh um, um all kinds of stuff mostly right now i'm just like i said i'm finishing my songs which is a really big deal to me um yes. i've got so many things started i've got so many ideas i've got so many rough demos that i i I'm so excited about, I kind of, sometimes I hear them in my head finished and I think the world can hear them, you know what I mean? And they can't, I have to finish them and, <laughs> and produce them and get the vocals on them and get the lyrics on the third verse finished and uh, um, get them out there somehow. I mean, my dream is always that somebody you know what i mean like what happened with human nature is going to happen again mm. you know uh, uh that's some great artist is going to hear them and want to do them you know i'm just kind of like a lot of other people um you know is uh, but in the meantime i'm just going to do it myself and do the best i can and put it out there 
you know? And if that's all I do the rest of my life, I'd be a happy camper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And like you were saying before, having having the time and space to be able to do that's important. You know, some people own studios. They they have amazing setups. <clears throat> they have amazing setups. They have all the gear in the world, and they don't have an original thought, though. You know. Um, yeah. Yep. They don't have any real great ideas. Um, um, if I do, I don't know if my ideas are great, but I I like them and. Uh, it makes me happy to hear stuff finished. And, um, you know, I truly miss, <coughs> excuse me, being in the studio with all the guys. And sometimes you like that pressure. Sometimes it's too loose having to, you know, being able to do whatever you want to do. I, I really miss it. I really miss the other guys in the room with me, pushing me in a certain direction. Um, you know, it's like you wish you could have that, and then everybody would go away when you say so. You know what I mean? Now let me take my time and do it. Thanks for pointing me in that direction, but um, I'm left alone yeah, quite a bit. motivation there. Go away now. Yeah, but I just try to um, – <clears throat> I'm going to try to do more things where I do have a deadline or impose a deadline on myself. You know, now it's kind of my age is kind of giving me uh, – not that I'm ancient, but um, – I'm still incredibly young at heart, but, you know, you realize as time goes by and you lose some friends and family that, you know what, you don't have forever. Mm -hmm. And I want to get this stuff out there and I want to get this stuff heard by people. Mm -hmm. I think I have a unique voice. Uh, um, I'm not talking about my singing voice. I'm talking about, you know, the the way I hear songs and the kind of songs I like to do. Um, you know, these days, what's good is that I'm not so worried about sounding like someone else yeah. or being a weak imitation of this film composer or a bad copy of something else. I just uh, the thing I, I try to do for myself and the thing I try to tell anyone else coming up behind me is to find your unique voice and then go for the balls with that. You know what separates you from everybody else? You know, don't do anything other than that, you know. Just do that as best as you can, whatever makes you different from everyone else, you know, just really go for that in a huge way. And that's what I'm trying to do now, you know, is I realize what makes me different than uh, uh, a Hans Zimmer or other friend or other film composers or even other writers. Uh, uh, you know, even though there's a lot of people I admire, there's a certain thing I do which I don't hear anyone else doing, you know what I mean? And uh, that's kind of all I want to do from now on, you know? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. That's great. So one of the one of the uh, new questions that we're asking all our guests now, Steve, is to tag a keyboard player. And what we mean by that is, is there a particular other keyboard player who you think might be uh, an interesting person to know more about or that you think our listeners might get some value from hearing them share their story that you could say to us, gee, it would be really good if uh, the guys on the keyboard podcast interviewed them. Who would that be? Oh, great. Um, Jeff Babco. <laughs> funny, uh, funny we've had Jeff. It's funny you mentioned Jeff. He was great. Oh, too. Yeah, yeah, and he was great. Look, he Steve was a gentleman. Star? He was a great bloke. Steve Weingart. Okay, yep. Yeah, I'll look into him. Great. You know who he is? Um, David Garfield has oh, been yeah. doing all kinds of stuff online, you know. Yeah, great. great. Uh, CJ Vanston. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Guys like that. Great. There's a lot oh, of great guys. You've just given us three great ones, Steve. That's brilliant. Yeah, Good. thank you so much. <laughs> Good. Oh, yeah. Um, and the other other brain twister, um, and we're on the, basically the final question, Steve, which is Desert Island Discs. So five five albums you couldn't live without. Wow, mm. that's tough. Um, the run, the run, first the run, Lincoln Palmer. Oh, sorry, you go go ahead. First ELP album, yep. probably Brain Salad Surgery. Yep. Um, um, Close to the Edge by Yes. Great. Um, uh, first Elton John album, Sgt. Pepper's, um, how many is that? <laughs> it's four, you've done well. Have I done well? 
Uh, and the fifth one would be, geez, there's so many. There's so many. Uh, let's just leave it at that. Okay, yeah, well, that's four very great albums. Um, <laughs> Steve, ev- every single auntie you've given has provided a bunch of corridors we we would love to have explored, but obviously we all, we all have limited time and um, definitely want to let you get back sure. to making the great music you do. Um, you, met, you used a great term before, which I'd argue if you ever do a, a memoir should be the title of it, which is Suffering with Perfection. I think I think <laughs> your your whole career is a demonstration of, and I'm sure you haven't suffered too much, but you, both your approach yeah. and the people you've worked with uh, has been as close as to perfection as you probably get in music. And um, uh, yeah, it's just been wonderful speaking with you and really. Oh, appreciate thanks. It. I, I've been so lucky. I I've really been so lucky. I kind of uh, yeah. I, that's I've been really really lucky. I had brothers that were kind of. Uh, uh, showing me it was possible, and uh, and I, at the, at a young age, I wasn't going to take no for an answer. You know what I mean? I n- knew I'm I'm not a well-rounded human being, um, but I had to make this work. And uh, yeah, you certainly did. Thank you. For- you. Certainly made it work. No, thank you, Steve. <laughs> And there we have our interview with Steve Picaro. Um, yeah, as I mentioned in the introduction, he ha- uh, Steve had some great insights and just such a pleasure to talk to what I can, I'd can i argue is truly an icon. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I was really, as he was chatting, my mind's eye was going back to him under pressure in the studio, dialing in those killer sounds on his on his analog synthesizers and, and getting it done. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so interesting to listen to him talk. I don't think I could dial them in that quick on main stage with, you know, three or four good plugins, let alone what he had to do with the gear back in the time. It's, a, it's just yeah, amazing. Yeah, it the mind. Um, no, so a huge thank you to Steve. And um, uh, we may be going back cap in hand down the track to, to explore some further stuff if he, he, he hasn't got sick of us this time. But, yeah, fingers crossed. So uh, we'll be back again in a fortnight or so, um, but just a reminder that we are always keen to hear from you and you can do that via a few means. So our website is www.keyboardchronicles.com. We're on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash keyboard chronicles and on Twitter at the keyboard chr1. Um, and we still have the good old-fashioned email at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Uh, we do have a Patreon account, which I'm really pleased to say is starting to see some traffic, and I can't begin to thank our supporters enough for that. It really does help us both manage the cost of producing the podcast and hopefully bringing more content to you into the future. Um, so you, if you are interested in, in shelling out a couple of dollars a month, and you know who's not interested in giving away their money, then go to www dot patreon.com or maybe even www.patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles paul thank you sir for doing this 30 episode journey with me it's couldn't do it well thanks for inviting me along to enjoy the ride and what fun it was and here's to the next 300 there's a scary let's go for 3000 um (laughs) <laughs> 3,000. Um, and most importantly, thanks to our listeners. We, we wouldn't do it without you, and uh, we definitely hope to see you back here next episode. <laughs>